Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Edible Education 101. March 10th already, 2021. I am going to stall here for just another minute while the um, we always have a rush of people arrive right at 610. So we're we're trying to um, develop a good habit, which is starting on time to leave the most possible time for our special guests who give so much of themselves generously to join us. Um, you know, last week's class really had a deep impact, a profound effect in my household. Um, for one thing, the, the talk by Ade Briones um, about indigenous forms of wisdom and particularly her sharing with us how in her culture, Native American culture, the importance of patterns and recognizing patterns and seeing patterns as a form of insight and intuition and knowing, really patterns as a path to knowing was really powerful for me. And I had the good fortune of seeing a day in our class. And then the next day I attended a, another workshop and there she was again as a um, guest speaker. So we got to converse a bit um, backstage on the chat, which was really fun. And in interacting with her, my ways of seeing in the past week really changed. I noticed that um, I have this ritual now, given that we're in the pandemic and that I'm home every day and every morning, um, I go out into the garden and generally I go into the garden with a mind of what needs tending, what needs my attention. So what, what plant needs to be staked up or protected from birds or pruned or fed or um, what compost needs to be turned or moved to, so I go in with this mind of what needs to be done. What's, what, I, what am I being called to do? But after a day's presentation, I started thinking to myself, I'm just going to go in and look at the patterns. And um, it's just really changed the way I enter the garden in the morning. So uh, now, and a day also, I don't know if it was in our class, but in our conversation, she definitely gave me encouragement and um, context to converse with the plants too. Anyway, this photo that you see here on the welcome slide was the pattern that emerged this morning when I looked up in the sky, when I heard the geese overhead and they fly in such an amazing pattern. And the lesson for me this morning was um, look up. <laughs> uh, I don't know how many of you are like me, but with that cell phone in hand or looking down at a computer. We're always looking down. So just um, a word of wisdom from our um, indigenous teachers, look up, look for the patterns. So um, this week we um, have started to transition from, well, we've been transitioning, we've been exploring our own food habits um, through our reflections, identifying our favorite meals. We've traced um, where our meals have come from. And then we have looked at what the carbon impact and um, the social impact of the choices we make with our favorite meals. So we're moving from this kind of me orientation into we so that we understand our role in the system. And now we're gonna start for the second half of the class really examining the way change makers, the way entrepreneurs start to think about making change and finding new opportunities and creating innovation. So if you wouldn't mind in the chat, would you please share the food system's frustration that you wrote about this week um, and just populate the chat now, just name it, um, put it there so we can see it and I just wanted to tell you too, that we're gonna take attendance this way during the class. We're gonna have chats, we're gonna have polls, we're gonna have homeroom. And thanks to Zoom now, we can tell who's in class. So just be sure your, your camera's on, your mute is, is, your mic's muted, but 
um, this is a wonderful way for us to see the range of um, of issues that are rubbing at you. And um, this is the beginning. This is like the tap root of your exploration. And the reason you want to be paying attention to this is that this could very well be the seed for your final paper in this class, because what you're going to do is identify um, a, a, a frustration possibly, and then identify, is it a problem? And what's the magnitude of the problem? And who does the problem affect? Not just who, but what and where. And then you're going to explore who else is cares about this problem or who else is addressing this problem. And you'll kind of create a map or a landscape around this. And then you'll start to understand um, the white space or the open space where um, we start to frame and recognize opportunities. And that will become probably the focus of your paper. So if you struggled with, um, with, with an idea, we're going to save this chat and we're going to um, share it anonymously so that you can see the other um, uh, people in the class that might share your frustration. Um, it might give you an idea that there could be a potential market or need for that frustration. Um, I also wanted to talk a little bit about our, um, some of our readings and the listenings that we've been assigned. And I think over the last couple of weeks with the class that um, Shakira led and last week's class on land justice, how important language becomes. And you recall um, in one of your assignments this week or one of your homeworks, the um, podcast about the use of the word plantation and um, you heard from a number of people who kind of unconsciously use that word. And I wanted to, um, let's see, I'll turn, I'll stop sharing my screen now, but I wanted to run a poll for you as well. So here's a poll from the homework. What inspired the name for Chef Vinny Carbone's relatives Southern Plantation Restaurant. Let's see if we can get every, all 140 people in within a minute. So you've got about 30 seconds. You'll recall in that um, podcast that um, a lot of the people that the host wanted to talk to uh, didn't respond or refused to, to talk. Um, okay, so what's happening now? This is the, the last group of people that kind of hang out to game this, to see where people are voting. No, that wouldn't happen, would it? Okay, I'm in it end the poll now. Hopefully you got your response in so you can get credit for being here. Um, and I will share the results. And um, so the correct answer is actually the film Gone with the Wind. Um, if you didn't get a chance to listen to this, I really encourage you to. It's one of the <clears throat> most important, um, I think, opportunities to learn. And it'll certainly be relevant to Tiffany's conversation tonight. But the the, um, the 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 issue really is is that um, context matters and language matters. And as I think about the skills and faculties needed um, in today's world to be a change maker, to be an entrepreneur. Um, the ability to navigate difficult conversations, to hold brave space um, becomes increasingly important. And I just wanted to ask you maybe in chat, I'll go back to um, sharing here. 
Um, but I have another chat prompt for you. What facility do you need or what facilities do you need? What skills do you need to navigate a challenging conversation these days? Can you put some thoughts in chat as well for us? Empathy, patience, understanding, respect, honesty, sensitivity. Good. These are great answers. Thank you. So one of the things we've really been learning this and practicing this semester, and um, Tiffany's going to, I think, build on this further tonight and our special guests, but um, really the, <clears throat> the desire and willingness to engage in challenging conversations and also to create, as Nikiko very, um, I think, succinctly put it, to create a brave space to hold these conversations. So tonight we have um, a really special class. I'm really delighted to be able to introduce you to Tiffany Patton, who was with us, was it just about a year ago, Tiffany? Yeah, a, one year ago was the last class we held in person. And I, I was actually given this t-shirt that night. It was Secretary of Agriculture, Karen Ross. This says, keep calm and compost this, this shirt. Um, but it's been a whole year now since we've been on Zoom. So, but Tiffany um, led a wonderful class last year. Tiffany is one of the directors at Real Food Media, and she really brings, um, I think, a, a wonderful combination of, she, she's really an expert in storytelling, and um, she's fused her passions around storytelling and food um, and and really social justice and um, and activism. And uh, I'm really happy to turn it over to Tiffany tonight to be our guest host. So Tiffany, over to you and I'll let you introduce our guests. Thanks, Will. Um, it's, I'm really happy to be back here. Yeah, it was just about a year ago or like a year and a month ago and I got to do this last. Um, just to like kind of reintroduce myself, I'm Tiffany Patton and I'm zooming in from Oakland, California on occupied Ohlone territory. Um, I'm a co-director at Real Food Media where we use media and storytelling strategies to strengthen the food movement by decoding corporate spin, revealing the true cost of food and showing how we together can transform the food system. So at Real Food Media, we focus on issues of public health, climate crisis and food worker justice and not necessarily on the food itself, chefs or food writing. So this class today is really fun for me because what brought me to the sign of work originally was my love for food. Like I was a foodie like long before the phrase foodie was a thing. So while the topics in media that Mayuk and Tiffany produce and like and what, Real, and what Real Food Media produces may be different, at the end of the day, it is really all about the power of narrative to shape public opinion and transform what we once thought was possible impossible into reality. So today we are, our topic is food media, whose stories are being told. And um, especially in the light of just all of 2020, I feel like it's a really like pertinent and um, exciting topic to dig into. Uh, this past year has been obviously just one for the books. As a society, we've been going through multiple crises for years, right? Like rampant neoliberal capitalism, white supremacy, the climate crisis, and then just over a year ago, COVID-19 began to like spread around the US and popular media attention shifted. We started to hear more about like the unsung heroes of the food system, the food workers all along the food chain, farm workers, meat packing workers, restaurant workers, uh, retail employees. And of course, I don't wanna say that those stories were never heard or told before. We have outlets like Civil Eats and Eater that have been reporting on sharing those stories, but now it's become so much more um, in the mainstream, right? It's in the New York Times all the time, or even on Last Week Tonight with John Oliver. And there was another shift last year um, in how, and like what the media was reporting on. Um, it happened after the murder of George Floyd when larger swaths of the American population came to realize just about like how a racist America's past and present um, is. And a reckoning came for many like white-led institutions. 
in the world of food, we saw it with Southern Foodways Alliance from where my youth withdrew his fellowship, James Beard Foundation and Bon Appetit. And this sort of reckoning brought into question not only what stories are being told, but who gets to tell those stories and who holds the power. And it turns out across the board, the people who have been telling those stories and who hold a lot of power are normally like cis het white males. So that brings us to today's class where we ask whose stories are being told and who gets to tell those stories. So I'm really excited to have Tiffany Rosier and Mayuk Sen here to dive into those questions with us and share their experiences. Tiffany is a chef, writer and creator and host of the podcast Afros and Knives, a podcast that celebrates and uplifts black women in food. It just started its fourth season. Um, so congratulations, Tiffany. Uh, and Mayuk is a James Beard award-winning writer and author of the forthcoming Tastemakers, Seven Immigrant Women Who Revolutionized Food in America. It'll be out in November, but you can pre-order it now. Um, so thank you, you two, for joining us. Uh, is Mayuk around? Oh, I'm there here. <laughs> Hello. Yes, thank you so much for the very kind introduction. <laughs> um, so... Just starting off, let's see, Mayuk, in your piece, The Wild and Irresistibly Saucy Tale of the Curry Con Man, you say, the story of Smile, uh, the Curry Con Man, uh, and his remarkable ruse shows that fawning over male chefs and the ache to anoint them celebrities is a very old American pastime. In fact, it's a practice that predates the advent of food television, stretching back over a century. So I think we're, most of us are pretty familiar with the various darlings in the food world. You see them once and then they're everywhere, like in all the articles, on podcasts, on IGTV, probably on TikTok. I'm not on TikTok, TikTok but I'm assuming that's, they're there too. Um, we hear their stories and opinions over and over again. And not that there's anything like inherently wrong with an individual becoming popular, but there are other stories to tell. And Mayuk and Tiffany, that's what you do. You tell the stories that aren't about those celebrities. So can you tell us like why and how you chose your focus? Totally. Uh, Tiffany, do you want to start or should I no, start? No, you're already, you're already in it. Go for it. Okay. Well, first of all, I should preface this by saying that I did not choose the headline for that piece that uh, Tiffany very kindly excerpted. excerpted <laughs> to, so uh, yeah. So um, in terms of kind of how I chose my focus, so uh, I'll start at the beginning. So I uh, I got to food media almost five years ago now by total accident. Uh, I was hired as a staff writer at a site called Food 52, which some of you might be familiar with. Uh, and I was 24 at the time. I had no food writing experience. I was just an aspiring film critic who wrote about topics relating to culture that had everything to do with topics about food basically. Uh, but they wanted to hire someone different who wasn't necessarily a cooking enthusiast. So I just kind of dropped into this uh, very white institution uh, unexpectedly. And I felt that difference immediately when I looked around um, at my peers in the office because all of them were white women who like lived in Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn. And then there was just little old me who was like, you know, this queer uh, Bengali dude uh, who grew up speaking two languages simultaneously. And I just realized that I was writing from a very different center of gravity than everyone around me. And so I naturally felt quite lonely at that job, you know, just from like, how do I you know, give myself a sense of purpose and, uh, you know, make sure that I can infuse this job with some passion. And so I found my kind of gaze uh, drifting towards figures who, you know, throughout history may have, like me, uh, you know, experienced some form of that alienation. So, you know, usually these uh, story subjects tended to be people of color, women of color, queer people, queer people of color, immigrants, etc. And more often than not, these are the same figures who, whom a uh, food history and the food establishment tended to elide or erase in some way. And so I became especially passionate about, you know, telling those stories in a way that felt empathetic and true and asked, you know, why it is that, you know, those stories were kind of written out of uh, the dominant uh, culinary history that we're told, which is that 
figures like Julia Child and James Beard, for example, are the ones who are responsible for making quote unquote American food what it is and food culture in America what it is today. Uh, and that often, you know, involved kind of asking myself also, you know, who was doing this erasure, you know, who is responsible for, um, you know, this cultural amnesia. But then I also wanted to affirm these stories, you know, and talk about, you know, what these chefs actually accomplished and what they did so that I wasn't purely framing their stories from Blind Erasure. So really it was just to stave off my sense of loneliness and alienation in food media. <laughs> um, I started the podcast, it was wholly self-indulgent. Um, I started cooking like 2004 and my first restaurant kitchen, I was the only like brown face and female body in the building, which is pretty, standard for American restaurants. Um, the biggest thing is to find someone you can aspire to be or that you can like kind of latch on as a mentor and that did not exist. Um, and if you've ever worked in a restaurant, you know that like, you know, working 16, 18, 20 hours a day means it leaves you very little time to look outside of the kitchen for those influences. Um, so at some point when I finally exited the traditional restaurant kitchen and I found myself working in like nonprofit programs around like uh, school lunch programs and things like that, I was, I was a food director for a private summer camp out in Washington. So I decided to insert myself in kind of the fringe food jobs to see if we could find some of us there. And lo and behold, no. Um, so it was just like, all right, um, what do we do now? Because I realized at some point I had aged out of this idea of finding a mentor and having someone, you know, to look up to. And I became that person for the young black women who were coming into the kitchens that I was managing and that I, that I was running. And so I had to reframe my own narratives for them and, um, you know, create space for them in those kitchens and talk to them about, you know, being outside of the traditional restaurant career trajectory, because the thing that they were frustrated with is like, I don't see myself, so I don't feel welcome in the restaurant. So I don't want to be here. And so it was like, all right, there's other options. Like having a culinary education and culinary experience doesn't necessarily mean you have to work in a restaurant your whole life. So I became that person. I became the, the mentor that I needed at the time. Um, and so as I kind of turned those ideas over, I spent one year having to sit out restaurants completely much to my uh, podiatrist behest. He was like, you can sit down now and wait it out a year or you can have surgery and wait it out three years. So I, I just took a minute and in that time I was able to revisit like my love of food writing and my love of food media and to see what it really looked like at the time. Um, because again, like when you're working that much, you aren't reading magazines and you aren't paying attention to podcasts and stuff like that. You really just don't have time. So when I finally was able to look into it again, I was just like, wow, okay. Uh, so black people don't cook is what I'm, it, I can infer from all of the stuff that black folks just don't cook food or we don't eat. I don't understand how we're not here. Like, why aren't we part of these like bigger conversations? So eventually I was just like, well, I'm sure there are black women in food beside myself. And I am like on a mission to find them just so I can talk to them and connect with them. And so the first season of the podcast, I had no intentions of anyone ever hearing it. Um, they were not supposed to be for public consumption, but unfortunately the way podcasts are recorded, you really don't get a choice. If you want that bad boy, like, you know, to be able to play again, it's not like something you want to hold on your computer. Um, so eventually season two starts to roll around and I was like, well, I'm not going to do another season. You know, 10 interviews was great. I feel good. I feel like I'm connected to my community. And then I started getting emails and direct messages and stuff like, hey, are you going to do more of these? Hey, I, you know, I found like, I didn't know we were all over the place. I didn't know we were working in wine. I didn't know we were producing, um, you know, liquor. I didn't know we were in all of these spaces. I didn't know we were managing hotels. I didn't know. And so now I'm getting, you know, young black women who are connecting with the black women I'm interviewing. And I'm like, well, I guess I have to make a decision to pursue this or stop. So I was like, you know what? I desperately needed this when I was young and I was just starting out and I needed to know what my possibilities were and the spaces I was allowed into. And if I didn't see myself, how to insert myself. And so all of these women over the last 33 interviews are masterclasses in how to insert yourself where you aren't being represented. And so that's really 
like my my mission at this point is to give a voice to those who are typically told that their voices aren't aren't important. I mean, not that not I think it's even worse to go your voice is unimportant and we're indifferent to it. And instead of the we don't like your voice, I'd rather you have opposition op opposition there and resistance than to just have complete indifference. Mm -hmm. So something that stood out to me about um, what you both said was basically like you chose your focus because you wanted to see yourself in the work that you're doing. Um, you want to combat erasure, um, become the mentor that you needed. Um, that's really powerful. I'm wondering like what has been some of the reactions that you've gotten to the type of media that you've been producing? Even though it was like for yourself, but obviously since there are so many other people who are like, like you um, around. So yeah, what has the impact been or the kind of response that you've been getting? I, I have gotten a lot, I, strangely enough, I've gotten a lot of emotional responses, a lot of tears, a lot of like deep appreciation and gratitude and joy, um, a lot of like healing, that kind of moment where they're kind of like, someone sees me and they, they said I was important and important enough to put my stories in front of the world. So I get a lot of that. I'm like, you know, like being a black woman in the United States is a very unique experience and it's hard to articulate that most of the time. And we aren't asked about our stories. We are, our stories are typically like extracted and exploited, but we aren't necessarily asked ourselves about you know, our experiences and what has happened to us. And, and, you know, they don't come directly to the source. And it's usually a quote that's taken out of context, or it's a conversation that it, there's a snapshot of a moment in that conversation where there's zero context, and no one understands why you said or responded the way you did. Um, so yeah, I just get a lot of emotional responses. I get a lot of like, I've had conversations where I'm like setting up an interview, and we start talking and next, thing you know, it's just tears and like, catharsis and release and a lot of those things. So, so that's been like the biggest response from, from listeners and from my interviewers. Yeah, I would say um, I definitely um, have had similarly uh, emotional responses from readers, which is always quite nice. But what is also very meaningful to me is- a uh, progress. Sorry, go Sorry, Sorry. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, uh, okay. Anyway, um, so when I write posthumous profiles, especially, uh, you know, what I find so um, gratifying is to receive a note or an email from a family member of that deceased story subject who says, you know, thank you so much for doing right by my family member who was not given their due by, you know, the food establishment or the New York Times or all these other places that have for so long kind of determined, you know, who is important and who isn't by virtue of just, you know, who they give a story, who they give an obituary, et cetera. So um, I, that really means a lot to get that kind of note as well. Um, so Tiffany, you just mentioned um, about like, sometimes when people are getting their stories told it's taken out of context or just like, a, yeah, it's like a random quote they pull. And Mayuki also mentioned like not wanting to center just like not having like a person's story just be about how they're erased or really talk about their life. Um, and I'm wondering, let's see, for, so for some people who maybe don't share like the same identity as the person that they like want to like, that they want to interview, um, how can they do that in a way that doesn't like center deficit or lack? Because um, I feel like that's often how communities of color are like talked about when other people are like reporting on them, right? It's like, look at what they don't have. And um, so how do people go about like gathering those stories in a way that is ethical. I can Sorry, start. Okay. <laughs> okay, okay. I can go yeah. if you need to say. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> um, the one thing I always tell people is frame people the way you wanna be framed. You're talking to a human being. You want your wins to be celebrated. You want people to have empathy for the challenges in your life. And you want to like hold whoever you speak to, whoever you interview, remember that you're the guardian of that story the minute they give it to you. And you need to treat it with the utmost respect. And because you would want the same it for your own story. So like, I think that's one of the bigger challenges when you start to talk about when you, when you know, stories about black people and people of color are in the news or in the media, a lot of times the framing around, you know, their struggles and their, their, their traumas and things like that, 
people forget that that is kind of part of the engine. It's the thing that kind of keeps those groups, those marginalized groups in the spaces that they're in is that you're only valuable if we can exploit your tragedy. And so when you start to do the opposite, like, okay, well, where, what are those wins? Where are they, you know, successful? What you want people to look at your life in the same way. You want them to not just look at the things that have been hard and painful, but you want them to look at the things that bring you joy and that make you happy that you've been successful at. So it's just always a matter of treat them how you would want to be treated, view them how you want to be viewed. And so like when people come onto the podcast and I ask and you know, I invite them on, one of the big things I talk about is that I protect their stories like they're my own, because that was like, you know, that's a bit of a caveat for specifically for black women is that like, we don't tell people things because our stories are often used against us or weaponized. So I make a huge point of anybody who wants to like share the podcast, post it on something, pull a quote or whatever. Like we have, a, I have a huge conversation with people about that. I'm like, no, I need to know like what that story's, where it's going, how it's going to be treated, who's going to view it. You know, I'm big on watching comments and stuff like that on social media because I'm not interested in my, in the people I interview having to come on and defend themselves. Mm -hmm considering that all they did was talk about their lives. Like we've seen it, we saw it very recently in um, like the interview with Oprah and Meghan Markle and the fact that she expressed that she was being, she felt suicidal. And the response to that was not to believe her and to argue with her about it, like in a social space, like, well, you know, it wasn't that bad. It couldn't have been. And I'm just like, that's not, no, it's not your job to evaluate the validity or the truth of that person's own story. You can either walk away and just say nothing, or you can listen, but these are your options here, but your option is not to put them on the witness stand and make them build a case for themselves. So that's really a big part of like, if you're going to talk to people who are in marginalized communities, talk to them the, with the same respect you would want someone to talk to you with. Absolutely. I think those are fantastic points. I kind of, um, ran up against them last year when I was reporting a story on a deceased chef who um, had struggled with addiction um, in her life. And, you know, um, she died in 2019, but, you know, she left behind a legacy that was uh, truly enormous for um, queer and uh, female specific uh, chefs and specifically female chefs, excuse me. And I got some questions from, uh, you know, people who knew her at the time who were also journalists who were like, oh, why didn't you, you know, focus on what happened, you know, like after she kind of fell off of everyone's radar and why didn't you focus on all that stuff, you know, like, did you see, did you find any truth of those rumors? And I just told them, you know, I wasn't interested in writing that kind of story, you know, because people who struggle with addiction are so often framed by members of the media in ways that are truly, um, you know, exploitative and just lacking in any kind of empathy. And, you know, and so I asked myself as I was writing that, you know, like, would I want to be framed in terms of, you know, my struggles with uh, alcohol or would I want to be framed in terms of my actual accomplishments and the fact that, you know, I, I was able to accomplish so much in spite of my struggles, you know, and of course, you know, that's, that really helped me kind of reorient my, um, my focus uh, in writing the story. So I'd say that. Um, and in addition to what Tiffany just said, I would also just advise journalists to, you know, um, reimagine who their reader is. I think so often uh, traditional food media presupposes a certain kind of reader who is white and affluent or is, you know, um, affluent to some degree and is probably cishet. And uh, to me, you know, what's really meaningful is kind of imagining that my reader is not that person who needs to be convinced of, you know, my story subjects worth uh, in some way, but rather, you know, someone who hails from the community or communities to which uh, my story subject belongs, if that makes sense, you know? so. I imagine them as the reader. I kind of want to decenter whiteness and affluence in that regard. Nice. And is there ever any tension when you're holding that like dual producer and protector role? Um, like, let's say if you're trying to like uh, get the story published in a certain um, in a certain like medium or something, and how do you how do you deal with that tension that comes up? It's so hard, you know, to kind of contextualize, um, you know, for. Uh, the the white Deborah or someone like that, you know, who's reading uh, and it's tough. But, you know, even when I'm doing that kind of contextual work to 
um, explain, you know, who a person is and what traditions they belong to and communities they belong to, et cetera. I want, I always try to read it through the lens of someone who belongs to those communities and make sure that, you know, I'm not, um, you know, kind of, uh, cutting corners in any way or misrepresenting the truth of that narrative. So, yeah. yeah, I had to do a piece or a spread for um, Millie magazine, which is like the financial magazine for real, real simple uh, from Meredith. And they wanted to, <laughs> they wanted to feature four, um, four women who were kind of, who were living at like the intersections of black and indigenous. And so they had found a couple of ladies that they were like, hey, we want you to, can you do this? And I'm like, of course, the, my red flag goes up immediately because you're a huge staff of people and you've reached out to this random freelancer to write this very specific spread. So we had to have a very lengthy conversation about how I felt it was very performative because I have, I'm at a place in life where I have, there's no, I do you a disservice by not telling you the truth. I'm not gonna lose anything if you go, hey, why don't you not write this? I'm like, good on you. I will, I will exit and go do something better for those women. So you have that and I'll go do something else. So I had, I had nothing to lose by telling them the truth. Like if I walk away from the situation without them understanding that their request was performative and the fact that when someone's looking at this final article and looking at the writer, and then they look at your, they look at your breadth of work and they go, okay, this seems real suspicious. Um, that's where I had to like double down. So we had, a I had a 20 minute conversation with their editor about all my feelings on that. And then I asked her if she still wanted me to write it, I, I'd be glad to, but these are my parameters for writing this and framing these women. Because typically when you're writing about these exact women, this is the process. They come through this like little machine and everything is sanitized and edited. And, you know, they create like a very Eurocentric voice around it because then it's edited so much that you lose the actual writer's voice. And now it sounds like a very, you know, sounds like the white editor's voice. And so now you're like, where are these women in these stories? Like, I know you interviewed them, but it doesn't sound like them anymore. And so that was one of the biggest things I had to fight for in those spaces. And I, you know, I wrote something else for like the Philadelphia Inquirer. And I had a woman reach out to me on Twitter and ask me what my ethnicity was because she wanted to qualify me to write the piece. And I was just like, ma'am, um, just so you're aware. And I just gave her the rundown and she immediately excused herself from the conversation because I told her I didn't appreciate the fact that I had to qualify myself for her. And that yet again, a black woman is asked to make a case for herself. And she was like, oh, okay. well, thank you. I just thank you for at least answering my question. And I was just like, you can't leave, you, let's not live like this. <laughs> let's not live like this. Mm -hmm. So um, you both have talked about like being the protectors of other people, but I'm just wondering like, who's, who's protecting you? <laughs> like in those scenarios, like y'all need protectors too. Oh, man, <laughs> well, I'm still working on a force field, but I am, <laughs> you know, who, my, the community of women that I am, I am elevating protect me. Like we have each other's back and it's, you know, it's kind of like a, a what is it? The, um, like watching the 300 and you have to create a phalanx and that's just how we protect each other. <laughs> you know, it's like, I will not let you, and I'm, you know, in that same space of protection, you're also responsible for making sure you call out ugly behavior on your own side too. If you see something damaging coming out of your own team, you need to like go, hey, wait a minute, like that's causing harm it doesn't matter who's causing the harm and which direction it's coming from. It's harm is harm. So I think in, in protection, that also is part of my responsibility is to make sure that when I'm interviewing people that they aren't, that they're telling their story and not in a way that creates more damage and harm for other people because they forget like the folks listening to your story want to hear about you and not necessarily about all of the villains in your life, unless it can add context and create space for healing. So the, you know, just to, to bring up, to create pain just for pain's sake is never something you wanna do either. So that helps me, that, help, that reminds people that, okay, like that puts Tiffany in a vulnerable space because I am so protective. They know that I'm out there making sure they're covered. And so they make a, they make a huge point to cover me. And so that's, I, yeah. And then most of the other times I, hey, Come at me, I'm good. I got weapons. <laughs> yeah, um, I would <laughs> respond similarly that uh, I'm very fortunate to have, you know, a small 
uh, group of people who, uh, you know, are like-minded with me in terms of, a, you know, our politics are pretty far left and, you know, we are actively anti-racist, anti-capitalist, et cetera. And they're the ones who uh, more often than not have my back. You know, I remember almost two years ago now I was at, <laughs> I became the target of um, a white uh, lady editor-in-chief of a major food magazine, a, a magazine that I adored. And, um, you know, she just came at me in a really, really racist way, very publicly on Twitter. And I remember when that happened, you know, I was so fortunate to have so many of those people within my community go to bat for me publicly, but also check in on me privately when that happened. And, you know, uh, like similar to what Tiffany was saying, you know, I am also very happy that those people know that that was a pretty uh, traumatic incident for me to, you know, kind of have to, um, you know, deal with publicly and, you know, stand up for myself publicly. And uh, they don't want to re-traumatize me in any way, you know, and so they look out for me in that way as well. But those are the people who protect me, you know, I can't really depend on editors connected to these uh, big institutions to, uh, you know, have my back. Ultimately, it's just, you know, that small tribe I've got. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so switching gears a little bit, um, Tiffany, earlier when we talked, you brought up a point that I thought was just really interesting. Um, um, when it's just not about like whose stories are being told, but also who's being asked to tell their stories. And, you know, we always hear from the same people, those celebrity chefs and food advocates all of the time. And, you know, so they're good with their responses. They probably have someone handles PR for them, actually. Um, but what is it like to ask a person who has never had to share their story before to suddenly share their story? Like what challenges come up and like what is surprising about that experience? Um, well, yeah, three, three, four seasons in now, the one thing I've learned and I, you know, and it's something to like not take lightly, I get for myself is that if you aren't asking someone for their story, they have no practice and it's a, it's a skill. So everyone knows like if you go into a job interview, you practice with a friend maybe or a relative or somebody and you practice that interview. So you're comfortable with what you say, you know how to package your own story, you know what's on your resume. And so that's no different for interviews in the public. So someone who's never been interviewed before, who's never been asked about their story before, they don't know how to frame and package their story in a way that's like compelling, that only takes five minutes, that's really clear. And it actually sends the proper message, like the message they want to send about their life and their work. And so what I get a lot of times with the interviews is that I, in, in the beginning, I didn't do pre-interviews and that was because I didn't need them. And that was very self-centered of me because later on, I realized the pre-interview is not for me. Um, it is for the, my, the, the, my subjects. And so a lot of times what will happen is I'll have an interview that's scheduled for maybe an hour. And because that, that person has never been interviewed before, that interview could take two hours because they aren't sure. They're very nervous. Some women are absolutely petrified. Um, a lot of, they get a lot of apologizing for their own story and for taking up any space at all. And so I have to like pause everything and talk to them about like, it is okay to be here. You are allowed to be on the planet, to take up space, to do work you love. You have permission to exist. And so once we get past that barrier, I think the walls kind of come down. They don't feel as vulnerable at that point. And so they open up a little bit. And so usually about a about half hour in, they, they're loose and they're ready to go. And that's because a big part of like my personality is I use a lot of humor um, to help them kind of relax. But yeah, it's you have to start talking to everybody. And, you know, like to your point about talking to the same people over and over again, the people who always get the mic or the camera. The problem with that is not that they don't deserve the mic or the camera. The problem is it's homogenous and nobody wants to watch the same thing over and over again. Like who wants to watch 23 hours of Chopped? Stop doing that people. Like no one wants to keep seeing the same person cooking the same thing from the same point of view. It's like entertainment value in, a, in an entertainment value context, it sucks. No one wants to keep watching the same thing over and over again or hearing from the same people. So like, I think this is why you start, you're starting to see food media get stagnant is because you're telling the same stories from the same people about the same things. And it's like, not that you need to let us in simply because you're black, like because we're black or we're people of color, like that shouldn't be the qualifier. The qualifier should be, oh, this is interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that stopped being interesting five years ago because you got 30 guys saying the same thing all the time. So it's like, these are interesting stories. These are stories rich with history and voice and color and energy. And like, why wouldn't you want to tell 
more interesting stories in the media. Isn't that the job? Right. So that's, you got it. Like for me, I'm like, I leave space for them to learn how to tell their stories. It is a practice skill, specifically if you don't have a publicist who can't help you write your story down and give you all your talking points on the red carpet and stuff like that. You are a freelancer. You're out here on your own. You deserve to have enough interviews in your life where you can actually tell your story proficiently and make sure people are interested in your work and interested in who you are. And so that the end the, the, the podcast has definitely become a skill learning session for a lot of the people I interview. Absolutely. Um, I, if it's okay, I just want to yeah. add that um, I, I agree with all those points. Definitely. Um, I think it's, you know, when you're dealing with members of communities who have, uh, you know, some distrust of the media historically, or, you know, have been told by the world that, you know, their stories are not, uh, you know, uh, don't deserve to be told, uh, or don't have that kind of dignity, you know, what I end up doing is really, I just try to make them as comfortable as possible. And I truly put them um, or put myself in their shoes, you know? And I think that being on the other side has honestly helped me kind of be like, okay, what is a manageable question for me to answer, you know, versus what is a really convoluted, uh, difficult way to, uh, you know, ask someone to express a thought, you know? More often than not, you wanna go with the former when you're talking to people who are not necessarily used to uh, speaking to members of the media, so. So we've been focusing a lot on like the subjects of your writing and your work. Um, and now I want to focus, like switch gears a little bit or switch focus, focus attention a different way and talk about like the writers and media makers themselves. Like they are people or you are people who also gain celebrity or recognition, um, like the social capital that you could use. Um, and so I want to like, I'm curious a little bit about like, what does that like social capital, how do you get that social capital? Um, and like, how has it impacted your, your work? And also like, how does it create barriers for people? Yeah, I, I can take this unless Tiffany wants to go. Okay. <laughs> um, I to say, um, you know, to me, to a fault, um, I would say that uh, too much of that kind of power and influence is uh, concentrated in institutions like the James Beard Foundation. So, um, you know, I, was very fortunate three years ago to win a James Beard Award. I was 26 and, it, you know, at the time I was like, oh, this is the best thing that's ever happened to me. Oh, I'm so happy, et cetera, et cetera. And now, you know, three years later, I'm like sobered up and I'm like, okay, uh, yeah, you know, it really, um, it's so, it's so unfair that it took me getting a medal that four or five voters decided I should get for people to suddenly take me seriously and, you know, give me opportunities and access to capital. You know, I did not change very much as a writer. Like I was the same writer I was before that medal as I was after, you know, yet that very, very arbitrary um, distinction and validation that I got from a very white institution suddenly made me a hot commodity to a lot of people who previously would not have given me a second thought, you know, they would never have paid attention to me. And all of a sudden too, the fact that I was queer and brown and all this stuff became fashionable to them as well in terms of kind of, you know, uh, I saw a lot of white gatekeepers who were attached to these institutions or powerful institutions like the New York Times, uh, you know, suddenly align themselves with me because, you know, it almost flattered their own sensibilities. Um, so I think this past year, has really exposed the limitations of uh, institutions like the James Beard Foundation. I am personally very glad and grateful to have kind of gotten that out of the way very early on in my career so that I don't have to work for that kind of validation because it enforces a monoculture of storytelling. You know, there's, a, in the same way there are Oscar bait movies, you know, there are beard bait uh, stories, you know, there's a certain kind of story that always nets that kind of recognition and it more often than not is pitched with a white reader in mind and we need to do away with that completely. And there's so many talented writers of color and writers who belong to marginalized populations who did not have the same stroke of luck that I had. And as a result, they didn't have the same access to capital opportunities that I got as a result of that dinky little award, you know? so. Uh, I, I've personally become pretty passionate about the abolishing awards in our industry, you know, because it's, it's totally screwed up, but yeah. It helps no one. It absolutely doesn't help anybody. And like, to your point about, um, 
about when you when you institutionalize these things, it essentially it's driven by capitalism, of course, like what sells more magazines, what sells more issues. And, you know, are the response to that, like the audience is responsible for buying those things and consuming that media. So if you want these institutions to make a pivot to disappear, you have to put your energy and your money and your opinions and all of that, all that social capital has to go behind things that matter. And specifically that matter to you. And I think a lot of times, like what I've noticed over time in the last year, maybe two years with like social media, what, what, is being told to the public is that you have autonomy, you have a voice, you have all these, you have this independence about your opinion. When, you know, once you started packaging Facebook and Instagram and TikTok and you, you know, started selling ads to advertisers and things like that, you know, that kind of just went away. Like that's a wrap. Like the, these platforms belong to those advertisers now. The same way that when we used to have like radio stations that played actual music and like new bands and things like that, which I might be aging myself right now, but there was a time where radio played new music and you got to know new bands and, and like new songs through the actual radio in your car. And then there was a point where corporations started buying up radio. And so your messaging became compacted and, and, you know, sanitized and you were told what you needed to buy and where you needed to go and who you needed to listen to and those kinds of things. It's no different than, you know, food media at this point with like that idea of like, this is the audience that's gonna buy this magazine. It's like that, but that's not the audience buying your magazine. So like, what's the, what's the real problem then? You've decided that, okay, it's not who's reading the magazine, it's who's buying it. It's about the dollars, about it's the value of that dollar. And so that's, you know, when you're thinking about where to put your attention and your time from this point, like who gets that capital, you have to shift what you think is important and like go ahead and buy into your own gut and your own instincts and go, I don't want to read about that. I don't want to watch Chopped anymore. I don't want to be, I don't want to watch like the travel, the travel network, another one of those where it's like, okay, we went from traveling around the world to watching a group of white guys chase paranormal activity around the world. Like no one wants to watch that for hours on end, but the audience disappears and doesn't say anything. Like you can't be silent about that stuff. You have to be like, we don't want to read this anymore. We're not going to watch this anymore. Like Netflix, one of my favorite moments, a show gets canceled, a movie gets pulled and the entire world erupts into flames and goes, we want that show back. We want that movie back. And here comes Netflix. Okay, we're going to give it back to you guys. That is the power of that social capital. And people would just underestimate themselves all the time. Dave Chappelle, he asked everyone to stop watching his show and boycott until he got paid. So everyone boycotted his show, he got paid and they brought the show back. So we do have the power to do, to make these shifts in food media. I just think people have to find it important enough to do so. If you have writers that you love, that no one's paying attention to, make people pay attention. You do have the capacity to do that. Exactly. And you can speak with your money. I hate to, you know, kind of reinforce the idea that, you know, the onus should always fall on the consumer. But, you know, as long as we live under capitalism, that is going to be an unfortunate reality. And so as a result, you know, it's like shift the money that you have for your Bon Appetit subscription to, you know, a writer um, with a sub stack you love or something like that, you know, like subscribe to Whetstone subscribe to um, For the Culture magazine, subscribe to Pass the Spatula, which is the magazine by the uh, Food and Finance High School in New York. Like buy those small publications that only have three or four issues so they can keep doing them. That's how you shift all of that power from like your Bon Appetits and your Real Simples and all the other ones. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Nice. Okay, so there's still like four questions I wanted to ask y'all and we have seven minutes. So I'm trying to, <laughs> so I think I'm just gonna, I'm gonna try for two. Okay. <laughs> I think that we can do it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so this is actually my a question that you asked uh, in your Eater article, who gets an obituary? And now it's a question that I wanna ask you too. Um, which is who gets spotlighted by the food media and how do such decisions determine who publications choose to remember? Yeah, I mean, you know, as you said earlier, it is uh, usually people with uh, access to PR folks who are doing the work for them, you know, and that definitely needs to change. Um, I have seen a few shifts within traditional food media in the past year um, as a result of the pandemic and especially 
the murder of uh, George Floyd. Uh, but that too feels so reactive a stance, you know, it's like, oh, these white institutions suddenly are, you know, clutching their pearls and being like, oh, like we have to care now. Oh, okay, let's do it. You know, you're finally responding to this moment of political and social and cultural crisis for these stories uh, to matter enough for you to give them real estate. And that feels just completely wrong. And so that's why, you know, I, I'm so glad Tiffany, you, uh, you know, you took the words right out of my mouth when I, um, because I was gonna say that uh, I personally have kind of given up in uh, on these institutions, like the NYT food section and Bon Appetit, you know, now it's like, I see a more uh, compelling way forward for free media that is independent, uh, especially black owned, you know, like Whetstone, for example, for the culture, all these other titles that you just mentioned, so. I'll wait for the next question. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. okay. Cool. Sorry. <laughs> so final question. Um, what role can food media play in creating a more just and sustainable future? I'll take that one. Um, I think if we can remember that food affects every aspect of life and it's a, a direct expression of the challenges that we have socially. So food apartheid, um, challenges with land ownership, all of those things are direct reflections of institutionalized racism. So I think in food media, if we can tell stories about food that push other stories, like not using food just for the sake of talking about a very specific crop or vegetable or recipe, but using food, using food media to actually tell bigger stories and using food as a lens for those stories. I think that's how we can have like the biggest impact. So when you talk about um, sharecropping, how does that what, what did share, how did sharecropping affect a lot of other things? When you talk about redlining and the fact that you have these neighborhoods separated by a single street that might have been walled off even in some in some cities. So how does that affect the access to food right now? Like why can't you get a Trader Joe's in certain zip codes and you can get Trader Joe's in another one? Why can you go to the same grocery store in one neighborhood and go three blocks over and pay $10 more for the same product from the same grocery store chain. So we can talk about larger systemic social issues using food because it's a great equalizer. So I think food just has the capacity and food media specifically to tell bigger stories by using food as the Trojan horse and the vehicle. So I think we just have to take food a bit more seriously and like what it can do and its impact and its ability to change things. Like I, I was literally having this conversation last week with someone. When you think about this access to food, that in, in and of itself, and how many people are living with food um, insecurity right now. If you look at the history of the world, one of the biggest acts of war is to cut a community off from its food source, starve them out. So when you look at neighborhoods who cannot get access to food, it is an, it, it is an act of war from their government to cut them off from food sources. So we can talk about larger problems in this way if we're using food as the vehicle. Absolutely, I don't know if we have time for my, my thoughts, Tiffany, or if we need to end now, but um, oh. I was just, okay, great, fantastic. I was just gonna add that, yeah, like, like you said, Tiffany, you know, food touches everything and, you know, there's so much uh, capacity to, you know, explore so many uh, different social imbalances that uh, exist in American society in the world in general through food. Um, and one shift that I would like to see moving forward is for food writing to become less object oriented and more people first, you know? Mm -hmm. I think, you know, a part of the reason why I think the broader culture has not taken food writing seriously is because they see it as this kind of like piffle of a genre that is so focused on the minutiae and, you know, focused on food as an object, you know, an object of consumption rather than, you know, the person who cooks it, you know, their stories, you know, can expose some of those imbalances that I was just talking about, you know, like if there's a line cook, you know, they have a story that is worth illuminating that, you know, you can tell through the food that they cook. If there's a woman in a family who cooks, you know, there is a story there about, you know, is it expected that within the culture that she belongs to that, you know, women have to cook rather than men, et cetera, et cetera. There's so much there as well. Um, and so I would love to see less concern with food as an object of consumption yeah. in narrative terms. 
Awesome. That's great answers, obviously, coming from both of you. Um, so I think now it is time for a break and then we're going to have Q&A. Um, just really quickly, I want to say thank you again to both of you for joining. This has been such a great conversation and like I've learned so much from you and just really enjoy hearing you both talk. And thank you so much to Will and Pooja and Ava and everyone else involved in this course. Um, I will leave it to someone to handle the break. Thank you, Tiffany. And thank you, Tiffany. And thank you, Mayuk. <laughs> what a wonderful conversation. And um, it's just, it's enlivening to listen to you speak. And Tiffany, thank you for preparing such um, a meaningful conversation. So we're going to take a 10 minute break. I would just ask all the students to think about, you know, who are the food writers and media sources that you love and trust and find reliable. And one of the things I want to invite us to talk about is maybe our guests can guide us about how do we with intention um, define what we should be attending to. I mean, there's just so much, there's just a proliferation of channels, sources, experts. How do we think of ourselves as um, open-minded curators Maybe you can give us some guidance when we come back. So um, come back at 721 and we will see you then. All right, welcome back everyone. Thanks for that break. Hopefully you got a little bit of chance to think about who are the food writers and media sources that you love and trust. We've got some questions that were posted to the discussion board on B courses this week. And Pooja is, I think, giving those to Tiffany on behalf of the students. And if you have another question that's arisen out of today's conversation, please post it in chat and um, we'll do our best to get to it in the time that we have remaining. Back to you, Tiffany P. <laughs> awesome, thank you. <laughs> uh um, let's see. Okay, so a question is, um, what can students do to become more aware of racism in food media? And what can they do to help? Ooh, I would say just pay attention to the stories that are being told consistently. Like um, uh, William had mentioned earlier about patterns. Pay attention to the patterns. In, in what you're seeing. And if you're seeing a publication that all of a sudden, and even if it's non-white stories, if you see a publication that is consistently telling the same stories about the same food with the same tone of voice, that's a good indicator that you probably don't have a readership that's like challenging them and pushing back a little bit to say, hey, we want more interesting stories. We want more diverse stories, whatever that diversity might play out to be. Um, so yeah, I would just like whatever you're reading right now, whether it be a local newspaper or a major magazine, like just pay attention to which stories are being told over and over and over again. So even if it's like a, hey, we've got nine stories about grilled cheese and they just keep coming and you're like, I don't want to read about grilled cheese anymore. This is that time where you kind of go, okay, do I write a letter to the editor? <laughs> do I just shoot off an email to customer service? Please stop talking to me about grilled cheese. So yeah. That is one way to like, and this don't be afraid to use your voice. Like most of these publications have emails asking for responses or reviews. People can get on Instagram and leave a, 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 a comment under a story or on an Instagram feed for a major publication and go, hey, what about, you know, stories about this? If enough people start doing that collectively, you can definitely create some impact. Absolutely. Um, yeah, just piggybacking off of that. So definitely uh, read critically, as Tiffany mentioned, and also as we both talked about earlier, and sorry to sound like a broken record here, but you know, truly uh, think about where you are putting your money, you know, as a consumer. Uh, and, you know, I so wish that we lived in a world in which these institutions were and systems were not so broken that the onus had to fall on the consumer, but they do, you know. So as a result, you know, uh, withdraw your subscriptions from uh, those places where you do see those patterns that Tiffany was just mentioning. And, you know, redivert your, uh, you know, that money to independent food publications or writers who are doing truly uh, path-breaking work. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, and I would add to that just to also um, make sure that they are giving context. Like I feel like so many times things are completely isolated. You hear about like an isolated event or an isolated food and you don't hear about any of the story behind it or like the conditions surrounding the person or the culture. And that just, just a way of um, sort of what are we doing? We're just like commodifying a group when we do that. And so I think like pay attention to that as well. Um, it's something that really like gets my goat. I don't really know. I don't know. I have no idea where that saying comes from, but um, <laughs> yeah, just always look for context. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And if other people have questions, please feel free to drop them in. There was a question about real food media. Um, let's see. Okay, what are hopes for the future for real food media and larger food media in general? Um, from real food media's founding almost a decade ago and development to today, how have I seen the platform um, and interactive aspects of social media change and adapt into tools for disseminating information, community building and spreading awareness? So I'll just talk a little bit about real food media, but I think it would be great for like us to just, um, talk about like what our hopes are for the future of food media in general. Actually, let's just, let's just go there. What are our <laughs> hopes for the future of food media in general? <laughs> um, like, well, I know personally, like one of the, the unspoken things I had a goal, for, a goal of when I started the podcast is to actually create a digital media space for like tastemakers that are black or brown so we can tell our stories in our own way. Um, so that was one of my big ones. Uh, the, uh, and in that, I just am like really excited to see us take bigger risks. One of my um, last interviews for last season was with Fawn Weaver, the CEO and founder of Uncle Nearest Whiskey. And one of the things she said in her interview was that her level of success is equal to her level of risk. And I think for food media, that is a great, that is a, a, a great charge. I think we need to take bigger risks with not just what stories we tell, but how we tell them. I think there's room for everything from new visuals to different types of photography. Like, why are we only photographing food? Can it be painted? It was at some point. We have still life paintings and all types of museums to tell you that. Can we? Can it be a watercolor or can it be a graphic novel? Can we? What can we do to talk about food and tell stories in ways that are so fresh? and a little bit scary for like your basic institutions that are used to telling it in a very linear way. It's like, but all of our cultures are so colorful and we tell food stories in really unique ways. Like a recipe for me, like we've been, I've been talking about this with a lot of different guests that I've had is that just the idea of the standardized European style recipe, like black people don't keep recipes. Mm -hmm. You ain't gonna go to nobody's house and find a recipe card, a little box of recipes. That's not like, that's just not culturally, that's not what we do. If you want to learn how to cook something, you would take your tail into this kitchen and sit down as many times as it takes and you'll probably still get it wrong. <laughs> but that's how we pass on food stories. That's, you know, oral history is a major part of African culture and that is no different than food stories. And so like the idea of writing a, a standardized recipe or a formatted recipe, like, do we have to stick to that? Is that the only way to teach someone how to cook something? So I feel like for food media, like I want to see bigger risk. I wanna see us tell stories in really unique ways and ways that we haven't even considered before. And I'd love to see new visuals. Like I, I am dying for someone to write a graphic novel style a story about like a pit ma a barbecue pit master and like his two huge like what is it um superpowers it's fire and smoke like anybody just hook me up with one of those <laughs> like, I'd love to see that like written like the 300 in their graphic style novel so I think we're just doing ourselves a disservice by boxing ourselves in to what our current institutions are telling us people want to read and how they want to read it yeah, I love that idea of different formats. So my, my, my answer is like way more boring. So I'm very <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but I was a lot of time to think about this. <laughs> I'm glad. Um, you know, I just wanted to say, uh, you know, in addition to what I was kind of saying earlier uh, regarding um, a move away from this kind of centralized model where uh, these food magazines and newspaper food sections hold so much influence and, you know, profile there can make or break a career. Of course, I want to see a move away from that and, you know, a move to um, independent food publications like the ones that 
Tiffany and I just mentioned, you know, having that same kind of influence over a young talent's career. Um, beyond that, you know, I would also just love to see less of an obsession with celebrity and specifically with bosses. You know, I think that the pandemic, of course, I think it uh, exposed to a lot more people just the precarities of uh, the food industry um, in terms of labor and class and you know, food media, I think, is classist by design, and it more often than not uh, centers, uh, you know, the perspective of the person who has power uh, materially, and uh, as a result, you know, that really obscures the realities of, you know, the people who do not have as much material power, and um, yeah, so, uh, you know, kind of circling back to the very first quote that Tiffany read from my recent piece on J. Ron J. Smile, you know, I would love to see less of an obsession with kind of creating celebrities, uh, because it just is a way of just uh, papering over um, a lot of inequity. Mm-hmm. Anthony, could I chime in for just a second too to add a, a yeah, couple of um, experiences? One is um, I just want to really reiterate this um, point around um, conversing and interacting with the media. And I think it's a really good test that if those um, vehicles and platforms are not set up to converse with you or they're not interested in your opinion, it's a real sign. Um, I had an experience during the last political campaign where I had decided to give some money to an organization and I wrote to them a number of times and they never wrote back. They never responded that they got, you know, they'd never acknowledged my donation or my email or anything. And then this particular group has subsequently kind of gone up in flames and imploded, but it it, it was an interesting sign to me that if an organization does not set up an interface to interact with its constituents, it's probably not worth being involved in. So Mm -hmm. that's kind of an interesting way to test that. Um, Conversely, I think, you know, $5 a month, if you could afford it, you know, when you get to a certain point of life to participate actively with sources of media and leadership. I mean, through Patreon or one of my favorite podcasts has a Patreon, Patreon, you know, interface. And I sign, you know, I really enjoy it. I feel like, wow, this is really worth it. They don't, you know, they don't spam you with a bunch of commercials in the middle of the thing, like the one we heard on, on our homework, which is just, you know, who wants to listen to a vacuum cleaner ad in the middle of a food podcast? So I'm like, I respect that they're really trying to do this. So I send them $5 a month and I got a personal letter from the producer of the show. And it wasn't just thank you. It wasn't a form letter. It was like, I'm really interested in what you find interesting about our program. Okay. And so I, I think this is the power of the platforms we have. And this is, I think, the interesting opportunity for all of us as, you know, for lack of a better word, hope becoming enlightened eaters, um, you know, to participate and support and guide um, the conversation overall. And, and what's so exciting, Mayuk and, and Tiffany, about this class, this, this class is the future of food you know these a lot of the people that participate in this class either from berkeley or beyond on on youtube i sense are going to play an increasingly important role you know in this conversation okay that's enough for me i'm Mm going to give it back to tiffany p thank you will um i just wanted to add to something that mike said is about like you're overseeing celebrities and um, just, I'm so, I too am over it and tired of like seeing like the individual as like this person who did it alone. And that's never like, no one does anything alone. And the only way we're going to get anywhere is by working together. So like, that's, I want to see more stories of that, of like what's actually happening is when we're all pulling together. Um, okay. you see that a lot now with like all the mutual aid efforts, um, but not just mutual aid, right? Like in anything, in any initiative, um, it always happens with a, a group of people and not just one person. So we can find a way to celebrate everyone instead of just one person, that would be awesome. Um, and also maybe that means like changing how we like receive information too. I think we're maybe just so used to focusing on one person or don't have like, don't have the muscle capacity yet to really hold or encompass all of that. Um, but I think that's something that we could build. 
Let's see. Okay, another question is, do you see food media spaces directed to the Latinx population in Spanish? I, you know, it's funny because I was reading that question. I was like, oh, that's good. That's a good one to ask. <laughs> <laughs> I am in, currently there's a, uh, there's a sommelier in uh, Harlem um, named Chow McCoy. She's the beverage director for Cherry Bomb Magazine. And she recently started a, a, a language program called Lip Service. And essentially she's challenging Black people and people of color to either pick up the language, the second or third language they were trying to learn, or to pick up a second language to learn for the first time. And so I have been learning French probably since middle school. And um, some years I'm fluent, some years I'm not. And so, um, so she, what she noticed was in her research when she was developing the program was where those um, opportunities and that access stood for Black people and people of color to learn other languages and how accessible a lot of like those materials are, the support you need are, um, you know, if you get a subscription to Babbel, it's not cheap if you get the yearly subscription. So one of the things she's investigating with lip service is how easy is it for people to get access to other languages because she, you know, both of the two of us agree that if you have more black voices and more uh, people of color speaking other languages, you'll see media in those languages in larger numbers. So you won't just get, you know, a, a kind of a Euro voice speaking a second language and writing an article, you'll get someone who might live in a very specific neighborhood who might not be able to necessarily right now write in that language, but they want to tell those food stories and they want to tell them to that audience. And so giving people an opportunity to learn other languages and giving them access to the materials and the support they need, I think will give us a larger scope in which to tell stories in different, different languages and the different voices. So that, I mean, that's a half an answer for that question, but I think you'll see more media um, You'll see people to occupying more spaces as people learn to like respect and embrace speaking in different languages and not just in English. Yeah, I unfortunately don't have too much to add, you know, because <laughs> no publications immediately come to mind if um, they do. However, I'll write um, uh, Tiffany uh, to that effect, definitely, and Will as well. Um, yeah, I was just going to add one thing, which is that. Um, the food writer, Alicia Kennedy, uh, who has a very popular Substack, uh, she wrote a really wonderful essay a few months ago called On Translation, I believe, and it was about this very topic, you know, so I would definitely encourage you to check it out, and I can try to find the link right now and <laughs> drop it in the chat uh, if we have time, so. Um, I was just going to ask, because I'm completely unfamiliar with this, but what is, like, what is food media like in other countries, and are they like, are people as obsessed with food in the same way as, as we are? Um, yeah, I've no, I honestly have no idea. You know, I'm, I'm doing a food demo tomorrow with a chef who she has the only Somalian restaurant or catering service or something in New York City. I cannot remember the specific details, but she talks about how when she's visiting home that everybody knows how to cook. It's just part of life. And she's like, so we don't have the obsession around like celebrity chefs. And she's like, we don't understand why people even want these recipes because it's just, you gotta feed yourself. So I, you know, depending on the community, I think depending on how much Western influence is in those communities, I think you will have this kind of sense of you eat to live. Why are we recording it and selling it and like packaging it in the magazine, it doesn't make any sense to me. Um, so like from a handful of the interviews that I've done, a lot of the women are like, they're the first in their family to have any type of restaurant or notoriety around their food. And their family is very confused about why anybody cares. They're like, but this is food you eat at home. Mm -hmm. Why is it such a big deal there? <laughs> You're just like, I don't know. So it's like, I think it is a very, Western thing to um, to commercialize food in the way that we have. It's a, it's a very unique space. I think mm -hmm. I think it gives us a platform to talk about like larger systemic food issues globally um, that people might not be paying attention to. At the same time, it, you do fall into it's it's a dangerous space because you can become you can create celebrity culture around food items and people. So that, I think that's the danger of it if you're not managing that space correctly. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I will just add real quick that, um, you know, I've seen some interesting uh, food media outlets out of India, um, which of course is my ancestral home. Um, there is one publication called Goya Journal, which has, you know, for the past few years really consistently uh, published stories um, 
that, you know, really, uh, you know, bring nuance to discussions of caste and class and, you know, regional um, Indian cooking in ways that American food, food media traditionally does not. Um, in addition to that, Whetstone, which I've said for like the 15th time today. Yes, um, it's a just, gorgeous magazine. We stand Whetstone here. Yes. Whetstone. <laughs> <laughs> Satterfield is a hero, man. Yeah, he's amazing. And uh, he just um, launched a South Asia vertical, mm -hmm. um, I believe a few weeks ago. And it's being, um, you know, edited by someone, uh, Vidya Balachandar, who's amazing. And she is in South Asia, literally. So um, I'm really, um, I'm so compelled by the whole idea. And I love that, you know, maybe Whetstone really is creating a different, a more global future um, for uh, American food media, so. Nice. Okay, one last question. Um, how do you avoid exoticizing food when you're writing about a culture that isn't yours? That's a good question. You can start with an answer if you have one. Yeah, 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 yeah. it's okay. I'll, I'll uh, hmm. How do I avoid exoticizing it? Well, I, you know, as I said earlier, I usually just put myself in the shoes of a reader um, who belongs to the very community that, you know, I'm writing about. And I ask myself like, okay, you know, what are the words that I'm using to describe this food? You know, are they off-putting in any way? Um, are, you know, do they uh, kind of otherize it in a way that, um, you know, I, I wouldn't uh, if I were to describe a croissant or something like that. In addition to that, what I try to do is absolutely avoid any Western points of comparison. So for example, you know, when describing a dosa, um, I don't like to say it's a crepe-like uh, Indian food or something like that, you know? It's like, that's such a boring point of comparison. And more often than not, drawing the kind of comparison invites so many qualifiers, you know, it just takes up so much space in a narrative. And instead, I think that it's better to just describe how food is made, what the texture actually is, what it is, you know, <laughs> done being cooked, et cetera, et cetera, you know, rather than just make those kinds of lazy comparisons, they just muddy the water. So water. Um, I would challenge you to think about why you would think a food is exotic and take yourself out of the center of it. Mm -hmm. Like the food isn't exotic. It might be different for you because it's not something you grew up eating. It might not be food served in your neighborhood, but for the person who grew up eating it every single day, like you have to kind of consider the fact that, okay, this isn't exotic. I think it's exotic because it's not part of my personal experience, but like the food that your neighbor was eating is not necessarily something you grew up eating, even though they were your neighbor. So would you go to their house, have dinner with them, and then write about that meal in an exotic, from an exotic context? Like, no, you'd be like, well, my next door neighbor, they had, you know, these types of foods at their house. It would never be like, oh, they're, you know, because if you think of the food as exotic, you have to now think of the people cooking it as exotic, where they're from as exotic. And guess what? There's, you know, a million people living in that country. Trust me, it's not exotic to them. So it's <laughs> only exotic to you. So you have to think about like that word and why, you know, when we, because if as a person of color, as a black person, when I write about European food or I write about Western cooking or Western food, if I was to ask my, I can't ask myself that same question. I can't go, well, I'm going to write about breakfast cereal and I'm going to write about it in a way that it's exotic. <laughs> does it make sense even though it might be like as a black person who might not have had cereal in my house or as part of my culture then cereal would be exotic to me but because western and european food is the standard of operations in the united states someone writing about it in a way that it's othered someone would think i was crazy they would read that article and be like so she's never had toast before she's never had cereal she doesn't eat breakfast like it would immediately cause these feelings so you have to really start to reframe what is exotic, what is other, why does that seem like that's so far outside of your experience that you would have to write about it from that position? Why can't you hold it closer than that? Why can't it be just part of what you eat and something new you've discovered? Because you discover new flavors all the time. So why not that one thing just be something new you've added to your diet or that you, you know, were introduced to? So it's just like, I challenge you to think about like that kind of those types of thoughts when you're approaching food is where you start to like find yourself boxed in is that it's exotic to you, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's exotic overall. It just means like you've never experienced it before. So just consider that when you're writing about food that is not part of your everyday. Nice. Thank you.
Um, well, our time is up, unfortunately. I enjoyed talking to both of you so much and could do this for longer, but, <laughs> but there's a class. <laughs> no, we, will, we will have an encore for sure. I want to thank um, Tiffany Patton for organizing and curating a wonderful evening and Tiffany Rosier and Mayuk Sen. And class, you can reciprocate their generosity by supporting their work. Tiffany's Afros and Knives podcast and Tiffany's Real Food Reads is a wonderful group to get involved with. And we should all be pre-ordering Mayuk's book. And <clears throat> we will <laughs> include a there. reading in, in next year's class to, uh, to get it out there. So. We thank you so much for taking time. And I know it's late where, where you are. So you still got such great energy. So. <laughs> Caffeine, nothing but <laughs> I will say like, William, thank you for pointing out the fact that like that Patreon scenario, mm -hmm. like people don't understand how much that means to like someone like myself. Like I have a Patreon. I love to look at comments to see how like my work is impacting people because it just, makes the show better. It tells me what I should be talking about with guests, what kind of guests to go after. It really informs my work when I get interaction from listeners. And it tells me that like my, like these interviews are not going into the void. And, you know, I can pass a lot of that stuff on to the guests who are on my show who have never been asked about their stories before. So if a black woman is on the show and she's like, you know, I, and I tell her, hey, someone listened to your podcast episode and was really moved or inspired or whatever, that does so much for them too. So it's like that kind of random act of kindness effect where it affects the person getting it, the person giving it and the person who sees it. So like, if you guys like are into somebody's stuff and you're in, and an independent creator, like if they have some way to pay them for their labor, please be sure to do that because it does, it's more than just helping them financially sustain what they're doing it tells them that they're on the right track and that you're engaged in the work because that's more important than anything for at least for us so i thank you for bringing that up because i don't think people understand the impact that so, it has on people when you see a new patreon member pop up and you're like yeah. someone's listening <laughs> thank you for <laughs> reciprocity is a core yeah. value of this class so um we appreciate that so much and just before you go i just wanted to um amplify something Nikiko um, put in the chat, which I thought was really interesting. Just this notion that we could localize our, as we localize our actual diets, we could be localizing our media diets too, in a very intentional way. So thank you again. We're gonna go to a breakout room. We're gonna give the students, um, the learners, <clears throat> about eight minutes. We're gonna put you into um, different rooms, than normal, I'm gonna open them now, but we're just gonna give you a chance to talk about how you select the, um, uh, you know, how, how you think about choosing a representative group of media sources for your media diet, you know, and if you have any rec recommendations for your um, colleagues, please share them. So we're gonna come back in about 